Okay, so the argument then is who do you pick? Why are you going to waste your life? Notice that the fact, this is a really important part of it. The fact of our being low and small and stupid and puny is actually important. This is irony for you. You know, when we talk about good and bad and forces of good and evil, yada yada, we think in terms of the more might, the more smart, the more money, the more famous, the better. We think of good as being measured in quantities of strength, smarts, skills, money, health, etc. You know, pretty much all of our movies about good and evil show that the good guy has got more of those things in some combination than the bad guy. And sometimes we like the David and Goliath theme, but actually, even in the David and Goliath theme, what we stress is David's smartness. You know, because David was pretty smart. He takes five smooth stones, puts them in a twirling slingshot, the twirling kind, not the shoot kind. And he aims at the one part of a Philistine helmet that's open, which is just between the eyes. And he hits that open part of the helmet, so it's touching the skin, and it knocks Goliath out. Therefore, he can run up to Goliath, and with Goliath's own very heavy sword, you know, while Goliath is unconscious, with two hands, and probably pretty slowly, because the sword would have weighed a ton, cut his head off. That's how David killed Goliath. He made a, a smart, skilled move with a little tiny thing. Now, we do play stories like that. What we don't do, although we try, we don't play stories about how weak, how small, how nothing. is a juridical issue in the trial. It's not that we're unaware of it. We're all aware of it. I don't know a Christian who doesn't know at least the basics of the story of Job. Hi, ah, Job was this person. He didn't do anything wrong. Satan accuses God of bribing Job. So God says, okay, let's test him if he's going to turn against me. And then Satan's allowed to do all kinds of things to Job's family and finally to Job's own health. Which just before that happened, the wife said to Job, why don't you just curse God and die? That's the test. Job didn't curse God. He didn't want to curse God. So when that didn't work, even with the boils on his skin, Satan sends three so-called friends who, who sit there for seven days saying nothing, priding themselves on being there, I'm sure, and then fill up Job with all kinds of verbal diarrhea about, oh, God's righteous, and you're hurt, so you must have done something to incur God's wrath. And they go on and on and on and on and on about it in the pages. It's really disgusting to read their speeches. However eloquent they are, and they are eloquent. Finally, after they finish their stuff, and he says to them, Job says to them, Stop filling my ears with your words. You just keep blithering. He's nicer about it when he says it to them. 
So then Elihu, the young guy, who's the fourth guy in the friends, steps in and says, you know, you're sitting here basically accusing God of being unjust because you don't know why he did what he did to you. And granted, you don't know why he did what he did to you. But he can't be unjust. And after Elihu finishes his speech, which kind of goes on for a while too, not exactly accusing Job, but differently accusing Job of crying against what happened to him because he did nothing wrong. After all that's over, God steps in and says, Hi, do you know why and how I made the water and the hippopotamus and all these other things? And Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. And God never gives him an answer as to why what happened to Job happened. And then God tells the three hypocritical friends, self-righteous friends, okay, Job's going to make a sacrifice for you because you guys are the ones who sinned. That's the closest thing Job ever got to a hint. And Job did that, and he got twice as much at the end. I guess he got another wife or his first wife came back to him. I'm not sure what. That's it. Almost every Christian will knows that story, you know, in some measure. And they all, when bad stuff happens to them, they remember that story. Of course, most of the time when bad stuff happens to your typical Christian, it's happening because he made bad decisions. But, you know, God is letting it happen, and yes, we are weak. It's important that we're weak and slow and low and stupid. Because the argument really is the same as in the book of Job. How come you don't get mad at God for allowing or even making your life so pathetic? I mean, why? We have to pee, hello. Why did God make us this way? And, of course, that's the argument in Romans 9 that the Calvinists misread. The straw man is saying, why did God make me thus? How, who can resist his will? Well, by, by saying that, he's resisting God's will, okay? So that's why Paul answers him, who are you, O oh man? Not O oh pot. Who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God. So you have free will, you're talking back to God, so you're, what you're claiming about being unable to resist his will is a great big lie. The Calvinists can't read that. They can't read Paul's answer. They just talk like the strong. Well, see, the Bible says we can't resist his will because this verse in, in Romans 9 says that we can resist his will. Totally ignoring the fact that it's a straw man who's lying who is very much resisting God's will in the very words he says, who can resist his will. Duh. Okay. But it's still a fair question. Why did God make me like this pot, this ignoble vessel? Why aren't I mad at God for making me thus? Shouldn't I be mad at God for making me so low? See, all this time, and I'm not the only one who does it, it's pretty routine Christianity, we're always busy telling each other we're important, we're important, we're important. And we're, that's ringing hollow is, hi, there are billions of us, so how can I be important? We're mistaking mass for lack of importance. And then we also look at ourselves, well, I'm so low and so weak and so small, how can I be important? And we're assuming that importance should be measured as being stronger, smarter, richer, healthier, prettier, whatever. We're assuming that that is what worth means. And if we don't have those things, then we have low worth. That's false. And we're busy trying to compensate for our attitudes that, that worth requires those things by telling ourselves, I'm worthy, I'm a good person, I'm a good person, I'm a good person. 
Okay, but that's not about what it is either. We're not important because of whatever good we try to claim about ourselves. We're important because we're so low. The argument in the trial is about that. Satan's saying God made us defective. He's saying that the angels were made defective because they can sin. And he's saying that God made the humans defective because not only can they sin, but look at how low they are. Okay, but if God didn't make the humans low, Satan couldn't play on us. Couldn't influence us. So, in order to help Satan make his arguments, God made the human race lower. So Satan could influence us, and then Satan turns around and blames God for doing the just thing in order to allow Satan to make his arguments. You see that. Satan's nothing if he doesn't talk out of both sides of his mouth. Okay, but that still leaves us. You're important and I'm important not because of how good we are relative to each other or any other standard, but because we're low. Christ took on humanity because it's low. It was harder. Because it's lower. I mean, you work on a computer. You're listening to this on a computer. Or some kind of computing device. Um, you didn't used to be able to do that. In fact, the technology to make this recording didn't used to exist. So... It would have been a whole lot harder, in fact, impossible, for this recording to exist two, three hundred years ago. In order for this recording to exist two, three hundred years ago, you would have to be, we would have to be physically in the same room, or in the same space, or I'd have to write all this out. And it would take months for me to write it out. I mean, maybe not quite that long because they even had amanuensises then and I could just dictate it like Paul did, all of his letters. And somebody wrote it out while they talked. So I suppose you could say that. It would still have to be written out. And it requires a lot higher thinking than I'm able to think to just talk like Paul does off the top of his head in perfect meter so that he can say sh in shorter words the same content or better which of course means that you know God was controlling his soul means he learned Bible so well that the control could be that high and not interfere with his volition with me I'm you know more verbose I'm not as developed as Paul was but you see the point. The technology, the tools that we have today, enable us to do more and sh than before. So we're richer than today. We have more abilities today through our toys. But we are still innately the same weak persons that we were 2,000 years ago. In fact, in many ways, we're weaker than we were 2,000 years ago. Because what people did 2,000 years ago is they memorized. So they wouldn't have to write things down because it was harder. It was harder to... We, the, the tools that you had for writing were harder to use. And the paper was considerably heavier. So you learned just to memorize. You wouldn't have to write anything down. So in many ways, they were better than we are. They were better at building... They were better at physical things because they lived more physical lives. Okay? They, it was harder on them. They didn't have air conditioning and all the other goodies that we have today. But they were stronger, smarter, a lot of things. And yet, in certain other ways, we're, more, we're able to do more than they could. You see the point? Is we're weak. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's body varies. I only have to eat maybe once a week. But there was a time when I'd have to eat three meals a day. I, 
I don't move around as much as I did when I was younger. And I was stronger when I was younger. But at the same time, I don't have the needs that I used to have. And at the same time, I'm weaker. You see how this is going? You go from weakness to weakness to weakness, and you get weaker in the later stages of your life in certain ways, and stronger in your head if you're maturing. So your body starts to go, but your mind, if you were maturing, really starts to become the whole of you. And then your mind starts to go. What kind of life is that? What kind of structure is that? What kind of design is that? Was God fair to create us this way? And we say, well, it's due to sin that it's like this. Yeah, Adam was never like this. Every passing day was better than the day before until he sinned. But why did God design Adam that way? Why is there pee in the garden? You see the point here. Why is it fair for God to design weakness? The end of the last session would take your pick. Where are you going to waste yourself in? God's plan or Satan's plan? That's a fundamental thing. We all kind of know that from the beginning. We just don't have any idea of what that means. But we know that that's the idea. And we look at the Job story and we say, well, I, you know, God took everything away from me. This must be a task like Job. I'm suffering like Job. And we're real kind of happy about that. Self-righteous or not, we want to, we have a need to reciprocate to God. We can't do it, but we want, we have the need. So how does it reciprocate God? Seriously. Well, what was the story of Job? He wanted God anyhow. That was the test. Despite the fact that God made him weak. Now the angels are just flummoxed about this. Because they're way higher than us. And we, we are so busy feeling insecure and bad about our weakness, we don't understand its importance. I mean, for all the, for all the degree to which Satan despises us, and so do the, the demons, okay? Most of them are self-righteous. We have a totally wrong idea about the demons. They sponsor sin in order to keep our eyes off God. Whether it's moral sin or immoral sin, that's why they sponsor it. Because then we're looking at something other than God. But what flummoxes all of them is, Hi, look at these humans who are completely handicapped, unlike the angels. And they still want God anyway? That really is important to understand here. It's your weakness and your lowness that's important. Mine too. That's what's important. God wants it to be important. He wants the lowness to be important. He pours himself into it to make it important. And the angels just stare at us. And it's like, how can these weak beings want God? How is it that these weak beings are learning God? It's a total shock to them. Especially now that Christ has won at the cross. It was a total shock that he won at the cross. It was a total shock that he'd want to even go. Here he is, human. I mean, the book of Hebrews is all about this. He goes low. And becomes human? And suffers all the same weaknesses of humanity? How degrading is that? And then what does he get for all of his pain? Oh, cross where he just, you know, hangs there. He gets lacerated with human sins. Which, why wouldn't the humans sin? Since they're made so low and ugly to start with. Adam had to pee. Is that degrading or what? 
He had to eat. He had to breathe. He had to sleep. He had to walk. And God is going to take on humanity like that? And yet not sin. Not resent it. Not once. Not try to shortcut some solution to a pain or a suffering or a weakness. Not once. Because sin is basically an attempt to shortcut a pain. Something bothers you and, and you pick something in order to resolve the thing that bothers you. And the thing that you pick really is not good. So it's called sin. Misses the mark. Misses the goal. Greek verb is hamartano and literally means to miss the mark and it's translated to sin. So how is it these humans want God? Why did Christ want to go to the cross? So how come we do? We don't have the same cross he had, but baby, we got the same life he had. Not the same scope, but the same type. We got the same spiritual life. We got the same rules. We do not have quite the same goal. But we all have our crosses. Each one of us has a particular cross that God has designed that is the sum of your dream come true and your worst nightmare united in one thing that culminates at the end. And you get all kinds of little crosses before that as training aids. Crosses where you get too much prosperity or too much adversity because prosperity is usually a human's dream come true of some kind. We each have our different ideas of what we consider prosperity. And we have different ideas about what we consider adversity that taps us out. That's a deprivation of some kind in our minds. And God gradually unites them together into one thing at the end, one big blowout at the end. How come you still want God? Just like the argument with Job. It's to get us to quit on God. Not about our good deeds. It's do you want God or not and you keep on wanting God no matter what happens to you? The good stuff gets your eyes off God. The bad stuff gets your eyes off God. But you keep on coming back to God? You use 1 John 1 9 and you return? How come? Because you're too low and too slow and too small and, and too childish and you shouldn't want that. That's the perspective of the demon looking at you. See, the demons admire and hate us all at the same time. The angels are learning why God did this. Of course, the demons are too. And they're totally amazed, all of them. So your lowness and your slowness and your smallness and however far behind the eight ball you are in the spiritual life, that's all important. And then as you grow, of course, you become important in other ways. See, you're important if you're high and you're important if you're low. We're busy looking at, oh, we're only important if we're high. No, we're important because we're low. Because we shouldn't want God because he made us low. That's the heart of the trial here. So, do you waste yourself for God's plan or Satan's? Satan prides himself on going low also. He prides himself and that's his compensation. In God's side of it, it's, it, it doesn't work like that. In God's side of it, it's like what Job said. In my flesh I'll see God. I, I see you. I repent in dust and ashes. There's no pride there. Job's idea of value and happiness in life was to see God. Period. He didn't think beyond that. It didn't matter to him beyond that. He didn't he didn't sit there and think to himself, Oh, see, I've sacrificed so much. I lost so much. All he wanted to do was know why it happened to him. And God never told him. At least not directly. Maybe he did tell him and it's just not recorded. But at Job's lowest moment, it wasn't because of that. He turned around. The one sin that he started to really sin was to think that, that there was no... He wanted to talk to God about it. He wanted to hear God's answer to it. God never gave it to him. But God did show up. And that was enough for Job. Job thought he wanted an answer from God, but really what he wanted was just to see him. And the minute he saw him, that was enough, and he, he f repented. 
as he said, I repent in dust and ashes. It didn't matter why God wanted to do what God did to him. God did it, that's enough. That's the difference between the this wasting yourself for Satan's plan and wasting yourself for God's plan. In Satan's plan, you have to keep on justifying your suffering as a kind of martyr complex. And in God's plan, it just doesn't matter. God wants it. He's God. I'm not. That's all I know. So, you're actually... Your weakness is brought to its lowest ebb in God's plan. In Satan's plan, you hallucinate that you achieve something, only to find out at the very end of your life that you achieve nothing. So that's why you have to, you know, tell yourself what a martyr you are. That's what everybody down in hell is doing. Illustration is Luke 16, the rich guy in Hades. Plays the martyr. So those are the two alternatives. So again, like in the last increment, you got God's plan and you got Satan's plan. Take your pick which way you go, but understand whichever way you go, it's your weakness that's important. Not your strength. God has no use for it. My power is made operational in weakness. He just flew that into my mind. Second Corinthians twelve, nine and ten. My power is made complete in weakness, the Greek verb there is tell I oh. God's power in you, Christ in you, the confidence of glory, just through that in me. Colossians one twenty five through twenty seven. God in you doing his thing in you. You're weak, he's strong. When you're weak, he's strong. That's the, the trial victory. So the weakness is important. In Satan's plan, the weakness is given a false importance in that you are a martyr for your cause, you died for the cause, and you fancy that you actually accomplish something. You tell yourself you accomplish something so you can tell yourself how good you are, that you wasted yourself. But you didn't really accomplish anything. Because you built all your ideas of your accomplishment based on things. Well, the things are less than you. So they're weaker than you. And based on people's opinions. And people were just trying to use you to start with. So those opinions don't mean anything. And it's only at the very end of your life that you find out what a waste it was. And you have to tell yourself you're a good person because you wasted yourself. That's your compensation. Which is better? Peace out.